being with us here and there throughout the course of the day. Um, this is the Peace to the Polls Democracy Vigil um, and uh, hosted by the Peace Alliance. And we had a, a unique opportunity this month to um, that this is the same day that we typically have our National Monthly Peace Builders podcast um, at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, this is our typical time to come together. So we're merging the two and uh, I'm excited about that. Um, so we are recording this segment for our Peace on podcast and we're also streaming this on Facebook Live. So everybody wave to the Facebook Live uh, community out there. We're glad you're with us. Um, so our, our mission, I'll just, just reset us for just a second. Uh, our mission at the Peace Alliance is to educate, advocate and mobilize people into action to transform systems and public policy toward a culture of peace. We certainly heard plenty of that during um, our visit with Marianne tonight. We are guided by the four, the five cornerstones of peace, which are community peace building, humanizing the justice system, fostering international peace, practicing peace in schools, and cultivating personal peace. So all of those things have been touched on throughout the day today, and I know are first and foremost in our hearts as we wait for results to start trickling in. Um, today was designed to be a place of hope and sustenance while we all await the election results and celebrate participation in our democracy. I'm so excited for our next guest for our Peace to the Polls Democracy Vigil slash National Monthly Peace Builder podcast. Uh, Jay Thompson and Dan Kahn are our presenters for this evening. Jay serves as the Leadership Council team lead for community peace building, which was one of the five cornerstones that I just spoke into the space uh, for the Peace Alliance. She's also uh, the executive co-director of the Florida Restorative Justice Association with Dan. So we've got the two of them together tonight. Uh, and some of you may have seen Dan with us earlier. He presented with Jeffrey Weisberg earlier in the evening about uh, depolarizing dialogue. So we're glad to have Dan back. Jay brings her years of experience as an executive management consultant to the work that the Peace Alliance does, as well as the other many organizations she dedicates herself to. She amplifies indigenous methodologies as a tool to shift the pervasive violence prevalent in our social, economic, and political practices by centering our most vulnerable community members uh, to benefit everyone. And Dan is, uh, as I mentioned, executive co-director with Jay of the Florida Restorative Justice Association, as well as a volunteer with the Community Connections Restorative Justice Program. He is also the former National Field and Program Coordinator with Peace Alliance. So Dan held the position that Kathy is doing now. Um, he actually passed the baton to her um, just a couple of years ago. Dan lives in Tallahassee, Florida, where he likes cooking, riding bicycles, playing ultimate frisbee, and watching plants grow. Um, Dan is also um, loves playing music. I saw you in, enter or enjoying Cecilia's offerings there, Dan. And uh, he also does a lot of acting in the local in his local theater productions. Jan and Day, uh, Jay and Dan are offering a conversation today, um, the title of which is Restoring Relationship with Our Government. Um, some of the polls have closed already across the country, um, and if you have the TV on, you might be seeing some of those results trickling in. I think we can all feel the energy of anticipation around the results and, and where we go from here. I'm excited to have these two incredibly talented practitioners guide us through what next steps might look like for all of us uh, once we know what the results of today are and how we look to the future. So welcome, Jay and Dan. I will turn the floor over to both of you. Thanks so much, Deanne. Thanks, Deanne and Kathy, for holding this amazing space today. Um, it's really a pleasure to come together with folks. Uh, so we uh, really envisioned this as a conversation and uh, we, we thought about uh, three basic kind of areas that we can touch on that we can sort of structure our time with. Um, one is to talk some about restorative practices in general 
and the movement towards more restorative practices, what that looks like politically and culturally, um, as well as how this, as the, the title of the talk implies, how this can be applied to our relationship with government, with this democracy, looking back at our history as a nation and looking forward to, to what we can have. Um, do you wanna say more about, about that, Jay, about our time in general? Um, I think that you covered all of it. I did just want to go back and now that I'm off mic, really just honor and thank Cecilia for that wonderful display of music. Um, it's always really important to make sure that we are calling in those vibrations and calling in um, all of the opportunities for us to like build together uh, through music and song. And that was just really a very good way of <laughs> being in space with us today. So I, I do appreciate that. I think that that's a huge part of like the rhythm of what we uh, are about to be in conversation um, about as, a, as polls are closing and the knowledge is running in um, about who are gonna be our elected representatives. Um, and then the way that we can you know, use things like music to be able to build together um, with whatever climate it is that we end up with um, after this election today. So glad to be in space. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jay, thanks. Um, one thing that I've appreciated about the Peace Alliance over time, you know, from, from early days, it's, it's so good to see familiar faces also. I'm not gonna name everybody, but hello everyone who I know and, and a lot of what I don't know. Um, but um, one of the things I've appreciated a lot is that the Peace Alliance um, has cultivated and maintained this um, culture of walking the talk that um, that's part of where I really learned more about empathetic communication skills was getting trained through the Peace Alliance to lobby. If we're gonna talk to members of Congress about peace and, and their staff, um, how do we do that in a way that, that walks our talk? Um, and some of it using sort of needs-based, feelings-based language, a lot of active listening. So we I make sure that those folks are feeling heard. And similarly, um, we, Jay and I, as co-directors of Frija, we promote restorative practices. We promote the advancement of restorative justice practices. So um, the question that we're looking at partly tonight is how does a re restorative practice also look when it's applied to governance, to the system that we, we currently have? And to, to give folks an idea uh, of my sense of the breadth of restorative practices, it can be as specific as how do you deal with a schoolyard fight? You know, two kids or three kids get into a fight in the schoolyard, let's have a circle, talk about what happened, talk about where people wanna go from here. It can be as specific and, and narrow as that, or as broad as how do we embrace accountability and some form of healing or reconciliation, like in post-apartheid South Africa. There's a whole nationwide truth and reconciliation process, which for all its um, shortcomings, it, it did what it did and it didn't do what it didn't do, um, but it was a step towards, let's bring people to the table who have been severely harmed, generationally harmed, and, and been part of, generation, of, of causing generational harm. How do we bring people to the table in the aftermath of this to try to move forward as a society? So that, that helps lead us to the question of what's a restorative approach to our relationship with governance and with democracy and looking at the past and the future. Yeah. Um, and just a little bit more to deep dive if, um, people that are watching this are not familiar with restorative justice and restorative practices, um, but there are some essential questions that we apply whenever there is some form of conflict or discomfort or harm that has um, happened in community. And there are a number of iterations of these questions, but really focusing on what happened, um, what the actual thing is that people have experienced to happen and everyone is going to have their various different perspectives of what happened um, and allowing the storytelling of that to come through and to be shared amongst people that are coming together. And then um, asking the question of like what people were thinking about, what they were experiencing in the moment of, of, of this uh, occurrence of what happened. Um, 
And as you're starting to formulate what you're thinking about, it helps to give someone who might not have an understanding of how you were experiencing the occurrence what was going on in your in your body and your mind in the environment the influences and the triggers um, and then moving from there it and being at a different point than the moment where it's occurring you're able to have an opportunity to reflect and think about what have you thought of since what have been some of the impacts um, that have occurred since the occurrence um, good or bad uh, relationships mended or broken, information being shared, um, and then also looking at beyond yourself and the other person that you might have been engaged with, with the occurrence or institution or system or history, um, also thinking about who else has been affected by this certain type of occurrence. Um, and then one of the most critical things about building relationship and bringing people back together again is this component of how can we make amends? How can we do things right? What is it that we need to do better? Um, and as we apply that to this moment, this very critical moment where there's been so much polarization um, across the states, in personal communities, um, thinking about you know, how our um, institutions and our systems are causing harms to various communities that we have um, in the on this land, um, thinking about how do we make amends? Again, how do we use different tools that we have, like music, like circles, like art, like opportunities to have conversation, like these visuals, um, to be able to speak into those various questions that I was uh, communicating just a little bit earlier, so that then we can, as we have more understanding of each other, we can figure out how to start creating relationships and then get to opportunities to um, solve some problems out there in these streets, <laughs> like in a very real way and in an organic and very human way. Um, so just wanted to offer that about restorative justice and restorative practices that we like to infuse. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, we appreciate you and your time. Yeah. yeah. And um, to, to maybe uh, put a little bit more flesh on, on some of, of, of those uh, bones that we're, we're uh, laying out there, uh, there are practices and processes that are in motion that have been in motion for, for years now um, to create some accountability and coming together and initiatives towards healing around some of the, the centuries of, of our US history of white supremacy, white supremacism, and the, the intense violence, individual and systemic and social that has been part of that. There's a, a group called Coming to the Table, which is a, a structured series of conversations around the country uh, to bring out what, what are some of the truths that people have experienced and that their ancestors have experienced and, and what are some of the potential ways forward together. Um, there's a, a, another initiative out of the, the Equal Justice Initiative um, where that is created. And folks may have heard of Brian Stevenson, who, who was director of, of EJI. They created a legacy museum and memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. And this um, memorializes the 815 counties where there have been documented lynchings in this country. It's a, a look back at the history of of white supremacy and oppression in this country through that lens of, of post-slavery, Jim Crow, and how that manifested in lynchings. And there's actually two copies of each of these markers, monuments. So there'll be a marker for, for each of these counties, 815 counties within the memorial structure. And then outside there's a, a duplicate. And whenever that particular county is ready to, to embark on a process of coming to terms with their history, they can claim their marker, bring it home, and figure out what it's going to look like in their county to come to terms with that. Um, I, I believe Alachua County, Florida is one place that's been um, developing pretty in-depth plans, and the various institutions that existed for, for the last century, so through a lot of Jim Crow, have been taking some account of their role in that in this, this period of history. So for instance, uh, the Gainesville Sun is, is, was a, a leading newspaper in Alachua County for all this time. They have to look at how they reported the news 
75 years ago when this was going on, when there were actual lynchings happening in their county, how did they report that? Were they responsible? Were they in integrity? And what does accountability look like for them? And for the Chamber of Commerce, which may have promoted redlining and, and ghettoization of, of African-American communities and, and uh, limiting the, the uh, earning potential and the, the opportunity for equity for black families over decades. So they, they could look at their role. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, a living process which the Equal Justice Initiative has, has engaged upon, which is a, a version of truth and healing. It, and I think of it as part broadly of the umbrella of restorative practices. So this is all part of kind of an opening into a conversation of what does it look like to restore our relationship with government, with governance? What has governance meant for us? Um, how do these stories come to light? And how do we move forward together in a circle, because um, we all we're, we're part of this society, and how do we how do we share the the authority and the the wisdom that each of us has? That's some of the beauty of the circle process. That you never know what wisdom is going to come from what part of the circle. It's a it's a round and flat structure. Everyone brings their gifts. I appreciate that, Dan. And I also just want to, you know, check in again that we are opening up this conversation so that it's not just Dan and I now that we've kind of communicated what restorative practices and and spoken into one of the applications as we are thinking about uh, restoring um, our relationship with government and today being a vote. Um, I can just do a little storytelling about going to the polls today or actually even before going to the polls today. And I always wait and it's a very interesting thing because I always wait. People are like, oh, did you do your early voting, mail-in ballots and all that. I'm in Florida. I'm in Miami. <laughs> and so when it comes to voting, I feel like I need to physically get my body up out of the house and go down to the polls and make sure that my fingers are putting in my ballot into the ballot box. And I need to make sure that there's no, you know, any of the funny stuff that can possibly go on. Um, and so it was interesting because before going on, I'm on, I'm on a Zoom call meeting because that's the way that I do my life these days. And um, speaking to three of my friends, one is in New Jersey, another one is is in community, and and so I'm like, yeah, I gotta get off this phone because we gotta go walk over to the vote. I want to, I mean, to the uh, to the our voting station, and um, I wanted to beat the rain. And so we're like, all right, did everybody go vote? And uh, one person says yes, and the other person who is in New Jersey was just like, yeah, no, I'm not even going to vote. So both of us had the <gasps> aha lift. What do you mean? What, what are you talking about? We did the whole, well, you're not going to vote. Um, but it, it, it became a very interesting conversation. The person what was like, I'm not able, I'm not living in the state that I want to be in because they used to live in New York and now they're in Jersey. And so the people, I don't really know the people that I would be voting for. I, I don't, I'm not being able to vote for the people that I want to. And then I'm like, you know, and then the person is saying, and then I'm, I'm, I, I'm teetering back and forth because I've had actually so many problems in the new state that they, that they were in. Um, and so it was just a, it was a moment of pause um, for the other two of us that were on the call. One, because such a regional difference, there's no, like we were saying that there is no way that today could have occurred without us absolutely making sure that our ballots were in because we were in Florida and because we're having such a critical impact on our civil civil liberties here. But, so, you know, as people who identify as Black, as people who identify as females, people who identify myself as having young people in school, those type of things, um, that there would, there would be no way that that would be okay. And then regionally being in a place where there is this like disconnect, no relationship with the people who are running for office um, or being in space. And so what does that look like to be able to think about how we're supporting and having these conversations and communicating with each other to help to motivate and inspire each other to go to, um, to make sure that they're we're participating in civil engagement. And then there's another component um, that thinking of, um, I'm also working with my young person because I homeschool them. And so I'm really engaged in the educational content that she's learning. And right now she's doing US government. And so there was a line about um, you know, the constitution 
provides for us that when we are voting, we are communicating that we agree with our governance, right? So that's also a moment of aha for me because I don't agree <laughs> with a lot of the way that our governance and our systems and our institutions have been operating with um, like inequities in so many communities, so many much more large and like marginalized communities. And we, and I'm talking a lot, but I'm gonna take time. <laughs> um, but um, in marginalized communities, and we're giving more rights um, and opportunities to corporations rather than people. And so it was just like, how do you go? How do you, how do you negotiate? And how do you build a relationship? And and how do you kind of um, work through the internal struggles that was really being communicated by the person in Jersey who was like, ah, I can't, I can't participate because I don't in any way have any connection or agreement. Um, and so, and and both of us, the other people on the call, saying we should have had this conversation a week ago, a month ago, but we didn't have the conversation. And then so like holding the accountability of you know, all of the things that we were talking about and in, in applying restorative practice. What happens? What have you been thinking? You know, what have you thought about since? What are going to be the impacts if you don't participate in the voting? Who's going to be impacted on a larger level? Um, and, and all of that was like a really important and I think distinct conversation that gave me an aha moment about how critical it is for us to be engaging and, and creating opportunities, especially with our inner circles, to engage in these conversations because it's, it's critical at this time. I'm feeling like we're in um, a post reconstruction era again, and then that's gonna create larger contention with ourselves and the government when we should be trying to figure out how to really be um, civically engaged. Yeah, so um, welcome. Um, anyone who is feeling moved, inspired to offer observations, stories, um, inspiration, thoughts of where we go from here, uh, this can be a time to bring out some of those truths of your experience with governance and democracy, your dreams, your concerns, your injuries. Um, we, we probably don't have time to structure an actual circle where everyone gets heard from in order and then we go through each round. So it'll be more organic than that. We're, we're not gonna try to structure that. That would be about a you know, two, three hour process perhaps. But, um, but more organically, just any pieces of that that anyone feels called to bring up. We welcome anyone's voice if you're feeling it. I'll, I'll, I'll start us off if you don't mind. Um, Jay, what you just offered about uh, the idea that voting is, in a way, saying I agree with the way we're governed, really, I mean, I'm going to be pondering on that for a minute, uh, because I've been, I've been thinking a lot about and having conversations with people about the idea that um, there are many of us that are unhappy with the way our system is set up, right? You know, the two-party system, the... Yes, that you could be registered independent, but there is no independent primary. So if you're not registered as a Democrat or Republican, but you're in a state that's got a closed primary system, you can't vote in the primaries. You know, there's just so many elements of, of our current system that are not as open as we would like them to be. That's a nice way of putting it. And, and that for me, it all comes down to the electorate. It comes down to how many of us will show up and vote. You know, is it possible that in it's not going to happen fast? But if we show up in these record numbers every time, we might actually command better candidates because the foolish ones are going to be like, well, they're not going to give me the time of day if I try to run. So I'm not even going to try. Um, that if we show up in in massive numbers to vote, that we we could have the effect to to create a government that we actually do agree with how it functions. And um, so I'm excited. I was excited by the turnout numbers in 2020. I was excited by the turnout numbers in 2018. I was excited to hear that our early voting numbers were as big as they were. And I, uh, you know, and, and maybe today, you know, we'll, I don't know. I mean, there, there are going to be elections that happen today that I'm not going to like the outcomes of. But if the numbers of people that show up to vote are as big as 
some folks are projecting they might be, that gets me charged up because that that to me is the thing that could possibly affect the future change, you know, if we get the electorate excited. So anyway, I just wanted to enter that into this. Thank you. No, I appreciate hearing that because that is a piece of what it is to restore relationship with government. And what I'm hearing from you is that a lot of people participating so that we have a robust um, uh, electorate that is really informing the government with the types of ways that we would like to see ourselves be governed. And I think that that's critical yeah. Yeah. Um, to how we engage the space. Mm -hmm. is there Cecilia, else? I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, Deanne, thank you. I just want to acknowledge that um, I feel it's such a great sense of hope because there are people like you, Dan and Jay, that are out there doing this work, restorative justice, seeing all the numbers that are that uh, people are going out there to get voted. I, I sort of remember in the in um, one of these movies that I saw, like What the Bleep or something, where the 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 native person was sitting on the shore and he could not see the boat in the distance. He could not see it, but what he could see was that the waves were being blocked, mm. right? He couldn't see the physical boat. And he sat there on the shore forever and ever and ever, and then all of a sudden the boat appeared because he finally could see it. And that's where we are with restorative justice. That's where we are with nonviolent communications. That is where we are with these practices that are going to restore civility, restore common sense restore our government i just i i i kind of refuse to fall into this that we're falling into this abyss because i see so many wonderful things out there in the world that people are doing great things we here are doing great things we only need 10 percent of the population to change the world and when we have programs like restorative justice like nonviolent communications like the connection practice like heart math we are waking in, waking up to a new paradigm shift. And I also love seeing our younger generation. It might take us a couple of generations, but we have intergenerational, we have all this interracial marriages, gender marriages. You know, it's like the world is opening up. And I just feel so hopeful that th that we are we are on a precipice we just have to get through to this other side so let it come falling down let the whole thing collapse because on the other side of it we are going to rise up we're going to stand up we're going to build up we because we are amazing and i just want to really make that point that you w there are people just like you all like all of us here who are making a difference in the world that's all <laughs> No, I, I really appreciate hearing that as well, because having the opportunity to have an, uh, a, a really intersectional, super diverse group of people being able to represent us, right, by participating in government. I think Marianne was talking about everybody try to run, you know, in your respective areas. People participate in the process so that then we can see the, the shift, we can see the boat coming in um, on the horizon. Um, because it's there, the boat is there. And yes, I definitely think that this is an opportunity and a moment where we have, um, we can create the the uh, governance and we can create the relationships and we can create our structures within communities that we want. Yeah, the concept of faith, you know, we have to have faith that the boat's there. You know, we have to have faith that that the new way of doing will manifest, but we have to make the space for it. We have to create the container for that new way to rise up, like Cecilia was saying. And so, yeah, it's it, it's it's a little bit of faith for me, you know, in terms of of that piece. Well, here's a little little thing that's happening through evolution right now. Just a little aside <laughs> that young men are born with less than, you know, their testosterone is 50 percent less than what it was, you know, 50 oh, years wow. ago. And that's truth. That's that is evolution happening. So there's not that that intense drive, I think, you know, in terms of like right is might or might is right kind yeah. of thing. You know, that there's the the blending of the masculine and the feminine that's happening. So I just always default to, you know, the divine knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. you know? And we are the we are the channels to make that happen because 
I see a world of peace, you know, that's coming before us. Yeah. And definitely being connected um, and aware in those spaces. Dan, I see you. Um, yeah, I, I could share a little second, third hand fable. Um, some folks might be familiar with Tom Robbins, the author. Um, and uh, one of the chapters of Jitterbug Perfume, um, I believe the chapter was called, Where Are We Heading and Why Does It Smell So Nice? <laughs> and there was a character in the, in the story that uh, um, had a theory of human evolution that we sort of started out more reptilian and our early brain is more like a reptile brain. You know, the, uh, Jeffrey talked about this brain anatomy a little bit earlier today. Um, and the, our midbrain and even into our frontal lobe um, is, is very much like a mammalian brain. So we're a lot like mammals. We like, we like to cuddle, we, we get a little boisterous, you know, we throw things at each other, we're kind of tribal. Um, we're, we're warm blooded, um, but, but we're also a little bit like us against them. And that's partly why sports are so appealing. You know, let's fight it out and it's territory, you know, and sort of get our yayas out. Um, but that the next phase of evolution is what this character in the book described as floral. So from reptilian to mammalian to floral, and it's actually like towards the front, it's, it's, it's like on the level of light, of sharing inspiration that we really kind of cross pollinate each other. And that a lot of what's important for the next phase of our evolution is flexibility, you know, to be able to be like plants, we can grow through cracks and sidewalks, we can weather different storms, we can, we, we don't have to fight for survival as much as be creative and flexible and interactional. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a really sweet model, uh, which probably different people have said lots of different ways. Um, but I, I think in terms of evolution, yeah, it's, there's a, a lot that, that we're, you know, that we still are in the middle of that's very like, is reptilian and mammalian, not to disparage any of our neighbors. I love the lizards, I love the, I love the monkeys and the bears, um, but that's just a, a way of looking at things where, yeah, this sort of flexibility and adaptability and uh, you know, ability to inspire each other and uplift each other and sort of you know, grow like a forest um, may be part of our future way of characterizing it. Yeah, I'm sort of, Practices restorative justice really allows and it helps us to have a framework to be able to do some of that. And it's not, and as you're going through the process and as you're going through any form of evolution or birthing, it's not all going to be the floral roses, right? You're going to have to actually sit in and work through the conflict and the struggles with one another. Um, and I, it's, it feels like this is the birthing process that we're in in this moment, right? Like the, the, the opening of the womb <laughs> to, to let the flow come through um, and in being able to, to, to catch what is being birthed and to like mold it into um, a space where we can have so many more people um, that can feel like they're able to thrive rather than struggle, because there's so much more um, struggle, the, the, the more the pain of the shift is happening um, in this moment. And so like really being able to stay the course, um, participate in the way that we have available to us in this moment, right? And recognize and be checking in with and being really connected to our governing bodies and who is representing and that they're representing a large diversity of people and a diversity of thought and a diversity of dreaming um, for a different type of future is really, I think, critical at this moment and will help us to kind of restore those relationships with our government, because when we have elected officials or people that are representing and they're not able to connect with, um, with the realities of what's going on or the truth of the histories that have created the environments and or to be able to see um, a different future, then um, that's when we get held up in this process, <laughs> this evolution. Yeah, yeah it's a tremendously, challenging, exciting, wonderful, and uh, demanding in some ways time to, to be devoted to, to peace or to, a, to evolution. Um, yeah, like, like, like you were saying, Jay, to, to embrace some kind of a dream that we, can, that we can enjoy and to try to thrive day to day while also have openness to the tremendous suffering and pain that's been happening, that's still happening. 
It's, uh, it's quite a thing being human. Yeah, especially in this moment. Oh, I'm sitting, oh yeah, please go ahead, Kathy. Oh, did the two of you uh, create Florida Restorative Justice Association? No, uh, Florida Restorative Justice Association uh, was, I believe, initially a brainchild of Cindy Bigby and oh. Julia Denholm, who's now Denholm Di Maria, and Kelly McGrath uh, gotcha. over, over the kitchen table in Cindy Bigby's house. Um, mm -hmm. It was around the time when uh, Hart and Jeffrey had been doing some of this stuff, laying some groundwork as well, Hart mm -hmm. Phoenix and Jeffrey Weisberg in Florida. Um, and there were there were other folks who've been pretty active in Florida restorative justice. Florida, um, Florida Atlantic University um, down in the Fort Lauderdale area um, was where Gordon Baysmore, uh, who recently passed, was a professor and, and he was a, a pioneer in restorative justice. And, and there was a, um, it also, that became the hub of the balanced and restorative justice movement. The barge movement was a national movement in the 90s. Uh, to foment restorative justice practices. It took hold strongly in Chicago area. Um, I know Karen knows some folks who've been involved with, with the barge movement in the 90s. Um, it sort of blossomed and in some places took root, in some places it kind of faded. But in the, in the wake of that, going into 2012, 2013, that's when Frija was formed by the folks gotcha. I met. I love the logo. It's beautiful. That's Jay. Jay Jay's yeah. Jay, look, Jay, you look like a black Madonna with that, the halo back there. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you. I am um, checking and seeing in the chat um, some of the happenings that are that are going on. And I always think that it's important to bring forth the voices that I may not be able to come off mic. Um, and so somebody aligning with and recognizing that it really does feel good and it's, it, to be able to go in in person and and uh, bubble in your circle and then slip your ballot into the box. Um, that's exciting. And then some, there's some, some wins, um, deciding on what perspective you come from, that a Maxwell Frost um, um, is projected to win. I'm hearing that Marco Rubio must have won. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, learning and seeing that once people know about um, different tools like restorative justice and restorative practices, that they will be able to understand how those tools can help for us to be able to start restoring um, our communities together. So appreciating that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uplift those voices. Just taking a moment. This is an interesting conversation as we're talking about <laughs> restoring ourselves with the government. I'm chuckling to myself because my body is feeling um, the fact that Rubio, Marco Rubio won out here, like hearing that news and um, yeah, wow. what, what that's gonna mean and what that's gonna look like uh, for the next few years in Florida. I do sense a great deal of frustration because sometimes I feel like ugh, I think about that guy and I love Val Demings and I just just feel a yeah, deep sense of frustration. Yeah. Or seeing like history repeated and it's mm -hmm. the same way. Um, yeah. it's interesting. And then also the reality of the sentiment that there are a, you know, I don't know what the, the turnout was because I don't have my TV on in this moment, but, um, you know, that, that also might be the scent, the, the sentiment, he carries the sentiment of a lot of people in Florida. So part of restorative practice and justice is really trying to connect with and understand what does that mean? If somebody is uh, chosen as the representative of a certain uh, geographic location, and um, you see that similar thing happening continuously, and you can kind of remove this component of gerrymandering and, and all the voter suppression, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. And then it's like, how do we build relationships with people who might have different values than we do um, that might have different understanding of um, 
human connection and, and community and, and needs of a majority of people in Florida. Hmm. That's a real thing to be thinking about and be honest with ourselves about um, and figure out how, you know, we can work together to offer other perspectives, points of views and uh, solutions for a larger group of humanity. Yeah. And for our future. I yeah. I, I love that. I love that, Jane. And part of what you were saying um, inspired me to think about um, to what extent is our the, the way that people... hello okay um, as well as the way we typically decide legal matters um, you know I, I went to law school and this was somewhat frustrating and you can see it in, in electoral politics as well if it's one person against another then we sort of line up it, it goes it goes back to what I was saying about football or you know different teams this is this is how we do things and I I saw it influencing my psyche. Um, you know, largely during the primary uh, in 2016, because I was a big Bernie supporter. Um, so I, you know, I, I found myself, you know, this sort of partisan um, cheerleading along with the animosity that can come with it. Um, but yeah, part of what you're describing, Jay, of, of a more of a circular, like let's see what's going on for people on the ground level and what's really needed. Um, and maybe, I mean, I, I see a value in this sort of adversarial way of going about things. But like let's air out this side and air out this side and we can use our passion to sort of sift through it but it has a lot of baggage uh has a lot of drawbacks this way of going about things um and and you know some of it is that you know the the base can carry a lot of power if they've got this sort of fervor um so is there a is there a you know a more of a circular alternative can we have more of a more of a grassroots or a council structure where we we build trust and we build connection um and yeah that's part of why i love this work is sort of building awareness of and faith in a process you know if you think there's a way my voice can be heard and other people's voices can be heard and we can work it out um the more we build that experience and trust then there may be other ways forward I wondered too sometimes about the, for me, the concept, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but the, the concept that, oh, it's just a difference of opinion. You know, that person just believes a different way than I believe. While that's true, um, the way that, that the opposite <laughs> way believes is, about you know keeping power from others and not not allowing access to basic human needs and rights um, to folks and I don't know I get that's where I get caught up is that I just want to call it for what it is it's like okay if you want to maintain power and take everything away from people that you deem as less than you all right but let's own it you know that's that's where you're coming from it's not just a different way of doing business. Um, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like sometimes we might be holding ourselves back from progressing because we won't call it what it is. Um, which to a lot of folks sound like I'm not being very loving and open and you know, we can all have a difference of opinions, but you know, we're trying to, we're trying to help humanity here. <laughs> I don't know, I guess I get, I get a little in my feelings about it and I uh, don't quite know where to go from there. Cause to me, it just, it's, it's like, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to let people sit on the fence anymore and act like, Oh, it's just my opinion. And I just have a different way of looking at it. You know, it's like, no, you're actually trying to stop people from having access to healthcare and, you know, call over their, their own bodies. And, you know, I mean, that's a problem for me. And so, um, I don't know why I needed to say that out loud, but I just, I wonder if maybe that's stopping our progress because we're just, we're not getting real about what that really means sometimes. So I'll shut up. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Dan. I think it, that we need to have some kind of level of honest dialogue and transparency about what's really going on mm -hmm. and call, call the spade a spade or call, you know, call, call the, the darkness what it is. But at the same time, you know, 
I think it's a lot to do with fear, and that's where that's where nonviolent communication comes in. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that you're not going to have enough? That your family's not going to have enough? That you're not going to have a roof over your head? That somebody else is going to take from you if we give to them? It, I think it all comes back down to the fear factor, and if we can address the fear of enough, and also you know the whole transparency of of money and government. I mean, I think Val Demin, De- Demings would have won if Marco Rubio didn't have all these massive don- donors. And that's where I find so much frustration around the elections. Is the elections always seem to be bought. And I throw my hands up going, what else can I do? What can I do? Mm-hmm. Anyone else feel that way? Well, I, I, I want to just acknowledge that Kathy's got her hand up. Um, and I'm just wa- being mindful of the clock. So... Yeah. Um, Kathy, do you want to speak and then we'll see? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say real quickly. Um, it's There is minority rule right now due to gerrymandering, dark money and politics, all sorts of things. And um, I'll just take the abortion issue. I, I happen to be uh, for a woman making that decision, but I can understand somebody who believes that that's life. So, so me, that's not say, I'm, you know, I can't argue with that. This is two different ways of looking at things. And I do think there are two ways of looking at things. And just because I say you're preventing uh, people access to healthcare doesn't mean I'm right. Cause they may think, well, you know, I pulled myself up from my bootstraps and they just can't understand everything that goes into that. Um, so there's a lot, you know, than just this is right, this is wrong. And then, um, let's see. Yeah, I think those are the two points I want to make. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Liz, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm going to try to say this quickly. I want to be mindful of time, too. I, I think this is, Marianne spoke very well to where we strategize. You know, let's, um, there's so many beautiful connections being made, and we need to strategize. And one of the things I'm thinking about needing to separate out, there's a, uh, there's a phrase that I love that says, you can't wake up someone who's only pretending to be asleep. No. And, and so I think part of it is, where do we see partners? Like, I think there are some people who aren't genuinely in that fear place. They're just seeing a path to power, right? And so I think it's about having really deep conversations about who are open to the deep processes of healing and connecting and and if it is a true fear, assuaging that. And, and Dan and Jay, I really am so thankful to you speaking to that, right? And there are ways to move the path through fear. But we also have to then, I think, be real about calling out, um, you know, people who aren't in that place of fear. They, it, it's just for them a way to maintain kind of a power structure that's working for them. So I, I think a lot of it is going to be both and and seeing Where's each person's heart? Where's each person's movement? And what are the conversations each person is really good at having? And then talk about how we strategize kind of in, in that framework. Yeah, agreeing in that. And I'm, I, I'm a believer because I've experienced the power that can happen when you do have a really strong facilitated restorative justice process or circle that happens because it does allow people who have had different experiences um, and a lot of harm to be able to speak into that and get some clarity about where the roots of that are coming from in a way that you can be your authentic self in speaking about that and then also really not just do it to just be speaking about how you felt or experienced, but to be thinking about who is impacted from your thoughts and experiences. And then what are the things that you can hear in this moment that will allow you to be thinking about and having alternative uh, considerations about how we can mend some of those things without it feeling like I'm losing something. I am giving something up, but I'm, I'm actually, actually, um, receiving something as a part of this process because it's a it's a way to kind of open up your heart um and we can do that in the framework of the way that we're thinking about our government and i think we can do that in a really successful way especially with restorative justice and restorative practice 
Thank you very much, Dan and Jay, for being with us and for bringing restorative justice practices into this dialogue and into this day um, as we uh, start to see results trickle in. And um, I just really appreciate the conversation and, and look forward to exploring it further with both of you. So thank you so much for being with us. And um, we are going to shift here with two